Yeah, so just before we start the discussion of illegal public policy, uh, let me remind you of one particular case I asked you to read in classroom uh, as part of our discussion of uh, duress and influence. I'm referring to the case of uh, Himans and Kofi. Himans and Kofi is reported in 1996, uh, 97, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, uh, page 596. Uh, let me uh, put it here. Uh, before we come, let me put it here. Let me create a list to write it here. Humans and coffee. Humans and coffee. Uh, I mean, 1996, seven. In court of Ghana Law Report. Five, nine, six. Yeah, so as I said, this is, uh, it's in connection with the, with uh, the rest and unsustainability, yes. Uh, yeah, so this is supposed to be an addition to what we've been discussing uh, in class, as I told you, uh, humans and coffee. It's not about the legality we are discussing. Now. I'm talking about the rest. There was an old man, about a 68 year old uh, pensioner, who was a building contractor. He had uh, purchased building materials on credit, and he was not able to pay his uh, uh, creditors or suppliers. So, uh, some of the uh, uh, creditors lodged. Uh, complain against him and uh, he was arrested, uh, detained in police cells for two months. But before they even arrested him and detained him, they had actually arrested his son because they were looking for him. They, not him. they arrested his son and detained uh, uh, his son for four days. And eventually when the father came forward, then they arrested the father and then they released their son. And uh, while the father was in police custody, the police threatened and pressurized him to sell his house in order to raise money to uh, pay off uh, his creditors. So he agreed and they arranged for a buyer uh, to buy the house and money was raised they were able to get to uh, pay off the various uh, uh, creditors. And he was subsequently released from uh, police detention and settled uh, his creditors. Now, soon after his release, he brought a nation in the high court, Accra, uh, claiming reliefs, among other things, that the sale of his house should be set aside as being reality uh, on the grounds of the rest. And uh, the, of course, the purchaser was certainly resisted. The purchaser also uh, argued in her defense that uh, uh, the man that is a pensioner had perpetrated fraud and all that but eventually when the matter uh traveled through the various uh layers of the court and it got to the uh the supreme court uh the supreme court gave a very uh, important uh explanation on how this particular area of the law uh, works. I'm talking about like the race. And for example, uh, if you look at the holding one, and of course it was the uh, Justice Aqua, uh, as he then was, he became a Supreme, he became a Chief Justice, who gave the lead uh, judgment. It's a very short uh, judgment I would like you to read, just from page 600 to page 609, so just 
let's say just about 11, uh, 10 or 11 weeks. So that is not uh, anything that you have to uh, be scared about. 10 pages. Yeah, so for example, uh, holding one, uh, quote, originally duress as a common law concept was based on threats of criminal activity. It consisted in violence to the person or threats of violence or imprisonment, whether actual or threatening. The present position to be capable of giving rise to the, the threat must be illegitimate, either because what was threatened was a legal wrong or because the threat itself was wrongful or because it was contrary to public policy. The question now to be asked was, there has been question of will, which will vitiate consent. On the first of the instant case, the contract for sale of the plaintiff house was procured through duress by the police and it could not therefore be enforced. Now, uh, you see, what we are learning from the Supreme Court decision is that it does not matter that the duress was not perpetrated by the other contracting. So if you look at this, in the circumstances of this case, uh, more or less, it was the police that were the protagonists as far as the intimidation or the duress, uh, which made uh, the man to agree to have his house sold. Nevertheless, uh, the court was uh, prepared to hold that the transaction had been initiated by duress. And in fact, if I may put uh, the direct words of Justice uh, Aqua speaking for the court, quote, in determining whether there was a coercion of will, such that there was no true consent, it is necessary to inquire whether the person alleged to have been did or did not protest, whether at the time he was allegedly coerced into making the contract, he had no reasonable alternative but to agree, whether he was independently advised, and whether after entering the contract, he took steps to avoid it. All these matters are, as was recognized in, um, relevant in determining whether he acted voluntarily or not. The entire negotiation and subsequent sale of plaintiff's house was the handiwork of the police achieved through the unlawful arrest of the plaintiff and his son, coupled with the naked show of unlawful force, force and pressure exerted by the plaintiff at the time he was unlawfully incarcerated in their cell. Contract or transaction procured under such circumstances offends all civilized notions of justice and fair play and cannot be enforced. Uh, and could. Yeah, so if you look at uh, Justice Aqua's uh, dictum, uh, as he then was, you notice that uh, he's using words which a law scammer uh, used in explaining. Uh, the rest in power on against lie you long. Yeah, so I will recommend that uh, you read the entire uh, judgment. Yeah, okay. So those who have just uh, joined us and certainly have some guests uh, who are joining us and we would like to welcome them into our class. Mm -hmm. If I say guests, we have people who are trying to refresh yeah, uh, memory on things that they learned when they were uh, in law of contract class some years ago, and they've already graduated, getting ready to write a law school and transformation. So they, uh, some uh, have joined us in this classroom. Uh, for that matter, let us uh, comport ourselves uh, very well. And we'd like to welcome all those people to this afternoon's class. So as I said, the business for the day is discussion illegality and public policy. And uh, as I always do, uh, this is a topic which has been uh, treated very well by my former teacher, Mrs. Uh, Dona, uh, in her book. So uh, chapter 11 of her book uh, is the, a very useful material which I would like you to read. And in fact, is uh, essentially the same thing that uh, 
who were taught by her when we were students in 19, as in 98 uh, at the University of Indiana. Okay, so having said that, uh, as far as illegality and public policy is concerned, uh, we will have to understand uh, certain introductory matters to serve like the context for our discussion. Then having done that, we will look at contracts which are illegal at common law, and then we look at the consequences of illegality. Then we look at contracts which are void at common law, contracts prohibited by statute. So these are the things that we want to be discussing. So just uh, before we uh, move further to look at the details of some of these principles, it is important for us to uh, appreciate that when we are talking about when we are talking about the uh, uh, illegality, uh, we have to remember that there is a subtle position of the law that the courts will not enforce or uphold an agreement or contract which is illegal or contrary to public policy. That is to say that all the elements of contract may be present. We have offer and acceptance with evidences and agreement, intention to create legal relation, consideration, where it is a simple or parole contract. Uh, we have certainty of terms. There is genuineness of consent in the sense that uh, there is absence of uh, factors such as mistake, misrepresentation, uh, the rest of new influence and all that. Nevertheless, the court may still not enforce such an agreement. The reason being that the agreement might have been concluded contrary to the requirements of the law, or it is contrary to requirements of public policy. And of course, uh, we know uh, as to cause a non orito action, uh, that uh, illegality or a base act cannot uh, be the basis of uh, a cause of action or cannot give rise to an enforceable right. So therefore, the court will not allow the recovery of benefits conferred under such a uh, contract. That is the general position that uh, we have to uh, keep in mind. And of course, uh, this is also a very good, uh, 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 what do you call the exception to the principle of freedom of contracts, right? Because freedom of contract, we often uh, tend to think that the parties have autonomy, they are at liberty to enter into whatever contract that they deem fit. However, uh, where it comes to illegality and public policy, uh, the parties do not have a freedom to enter into any transaction. Were they to do that, they will be disappointed in the sense that the court will not assist them to enforce their illegal transaction or transaction which is controlled to public uh, policy. So uh, we need to uh, keep that uh, in mind. So we will look at some contracts which are illegal at common law. In other words, uh, contracts which are uh, considered illegal at common law. And these include uh, we contracts to commit crimes or civil wrongs. If you intend to contract with someone to commit a crime, to go and kill someone, to go and uh, rob someone, to go and rape someone, or to drag someone and have liberty to the person or to even commit civil wrong, that is illegal. For example, if we take a contract, if you enter into contract with someone to defame another person, right? To go about peddling lies or falsehood, which will tarnish or will injure the reputation of another person, that is also a contract, that is a, a illegal common law. And again, uh, another illegal uh, uh, contracts, as far as common law is concerned, is a contract promoting sexual immorality. So any contract which promotes sexual immorality, for example, if you enter into contract with some people to uh, 
act for purposes of recording or pornographic movies that promote uh, sexual morality, or maybe uh, commercial sex, right? In our part of the jurisdiction, commercial sex is still not uh, legalized. And for that matter, if you entered into contact with somebody to have access to his or her body and he or she uh, you know, did not comply with something like that, you cannot enforce it in court. And three, uh, contracts promoting corruption in public life. Contracts promoting corruption in public life. If there is a, a, any which seeks to ensure that certain things take place, control to lay down uh, procedures in the public uh, in order. That is illegal. And again, contracts prejudicial to administration of justice. So if you enter into contract with anyone to try and enable another person to get certain advantages in dispensation of justice, that is illegal at common law. Then contracts prejudicial to the interests of the state. If you enter into contract, which for example, uh, seeks to say that you can topple the government or if you can assassinate someone and so on, uh, all those things are illegal. So we take some of these things uh, one after the other and see a few words quickly about them. So contract to uh, uh, commit crimes or civil wrong. So by here, what we mean is that where the purpose of the contract between the parties is to commit a crime or tort or fraud against another party, uh, certainly that contract is considered illegal and for that matter, unenforceable. And if you look at the case of uh, Alexander uh, uh, Reason, uh, the point uh, has been made uh, that uh, such a contract could not be enforced. So in Alexander and Raisin, uh, the plaintiff Alexander entered into contract with the Raisin by which uh, the agreed rent was split into two parts. The aim was that one part of the agreed rent would be declared as rent and the other part would not be declared as rent but would be declared to be for services to the flat concern. The ultimate objective was to reduce the assessment per rubric. That is the, the taxable you know, rate or the, the rate or the, the tax which they had to pay. So you are trying to, if you like, uh, uh, add weight the, 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 the revenue collectors. And it was all that uh, since the plaintiff intended to use the lease and service agreement for any legal purpose, the plaintiff could not enforce either the lease or the uh, the service uh, uh, as it were. Again, uh, the case of uh, uh, Foster and uh, Driscoll, a uh, contract to commit uh, crimes or civil wrong, uh, which uh, certainly include the contracts to interfere with regulation of uh, foreign countries. So if you have like a contract which will or seeks to enable another person to breach the laws of another country, for example, uh, such a contract is illegal because uh, countries are supposed to uh, get very well. And if you take Ghana, for example, uh, it's part of our directive principle of state policy, as well as the Article 73 of the Constitution that there should be, Ghana should be a responsible of the international community and have a good relationship with our countries. And for that matter, the cause of Ghana will not assist a person to uh, enter into transaction which will still undermine the legal arrangements of another country. So for example, if you look at the case of Costa against uh, Driscoll, uh, the parties entered into a contract uh, by which they intended to uh, load a ship cargo of whiskey uh, to be carried across the Atlantic. Uh, and later on, it will be smuggled into the, uh, the US. And this was contrary to the, the, the regulations uh, of the countries involved. And 
the court held that the object of the agreement was a violation of the law of the country. An agreement was therefore contrary to what? Public uh, policy. Yeah, so if you intend to contract, commit a crime, civil wrong, or interfere with the regulation of another country, that will be deemed as illegal and unenforceable. Uh, contrast promoting sexual immorality. We have talked about it that uh, if there is any contract which seeks to promote sexual immorality, same will be held to be illegal. And a well known case is a case of a P.S. Brooks. And the case of uh, a P.S. and Brooks, uh, uh, very interesting. And in P.S. and Brooks, the plaintiff, uh, a firm of, uh, uh, what do you call like the uh, builders of a, a coach, agreed to let a coach out on a high to a prostitute, uh, Brooks. And they knew very well that the prostitute using the, the coach for her business as a prostitute. So eventually, when the prostitute failed to pay uh, for the high, the builders or the, the plaintiff uh, sealed her to recover her money. The court held that they could not recover the high charge uh, because the contract was contrary to public policy as it sought to uh, promote sexual uh, immorality. And I'm sure you have heard of Lord Mellish uh, in his uh, famous uh, words concerning how uh, public policy is like an uh, own ghost. And once you are stride on it, you don't know where it will take you. Now, if you look at uh, a portion of the judgment of uh, Lord uh, Pollock from uh, uh, yes, and, uh, and Brooke. At Pierce and Brooke uh, is very instructive. So let us quote portion of it for a, a deeper uh, reflection. I have, Lord Polo, I have always considered it as settled that any person who contributes to the performance of an illegal act by supplying it with the knowledge that it is going to be used for that purpose, cannot recover the price of the thing so supplied, nor can any distinction be made between an illegal and immoral purpose. The rule which is applicable to the matter is S to P causa non oritu actu. No action arises from a base or wrongful cause. And whether it is an immoral or an illegal purpose in which the plaintiff has participated, it can be equally within the terms of that muzzle. And the effect is the same. No cause of action can arise out of either the one or the other, unquote. Yeah, so uh, we have to note how serious the common law views a contract which seeks to uh, promote uh, immoral uh, uh, contract. Well, you can also uh, look at the case of the uh, upfield and then the very interesting case. The plaintiff through his agent uh, let a flat in London to the defendant, an unmarried woman, a single uh, woman. I mean, just like a lot of uh, uh, the female students, they are all single. The agent knew that the defendant was the mistress of a certain man. And he assumed that the rent would be paid as a result of her being a kept woman. Uh, uh, that is, it will come from the man uh, whose mistress she was. Eventually, the plaintiff's agent gave the defendant notice to quit. The defendant failed to pay the rent for the last half year of the tenancy. And then the plaintiff sued for the rent, which was still owed to him. It was held that the plaintiff was not entitled to recover the rent because 
the flat was left for immoral uh, purpose. But of course, uh, don't uh, assume that when you go and rent a, a flat or something and they are demanding rent, you try and arrange and create the impression that the, the premises was being used for immoral purpose. So you go, the, you are dragged to court, you will try to set up facts which will support that in order to take advantage of some of this uh, case law. I think that would be inappropriate. So I'm not suggesting to you that you should do that. Then we, we've also mentioned agreements which promote uh, corruption or inefficiency in public works. And this will mean maybe a contract for the sale or purchase of public offices. You want uh, appointment to public office instead of going there on merits, then you pay money, you pay your way through, you bribe. Or you need certain honors, maybe certain uh, honors or awards, which are conferred on as a result of meritorious services. And don't you know of that? And you decide to uh, the system. Uh, so any contract we seek to uh, let to buy that uh, seek to encourage corruption in public. And for that matter, the common law uh, from uh, upon that. And that is why the case of uh, Parkinson against the uh, ambulance limited and Harrison. Uh, can uh, Parkinson was told by Harrison, the secretary of the defendant charity, that is the College of Ambulance Limited and Harrison, that the charity will arrange for a high to be granted a knighthood. A knighthood is like an honor. Just like Ghana, we have like the order of the voter the national uh, highest uh, uh, order and things like that. So a similar thing, uh, this person wanted to be knighted. We wanted a knighthood. So he said, okay, if you made a substantial donation, I will put you in the list of those who are going to be conferred with knighthood. So uh, Harrison uh, had told uh, Parkinson of the charities and royal patronage. That is to say that if you are putting your money in this charity, you should know that you are putting your money in something which is closer to the, 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 the throne. That is the, the, the king uh, of England. Uh, the queen of England uh, is a patron, meaning that getting closer to uh, corridors of power, so it's a good thing. So Parkinson uh, paid 3,000 to the College of Ambulance when understanding that you receive a knighthood also promised further payment to the charity in the future. When Parkinson did not receive a night, he realized that he had been duped. He brought an action against the charity to recover back the money that he had paid. So just imagine, you go to court, what are you going to tell the court? You tell the court that I paid 3,000 on understanding that I was going to be made the night, but they've not made me the night, so please, uh, help me to get my money back. So that was the kind of confusion and embarrassment which uh, Parkinson found himself in. So the court held that the contract was for the purchase of the, of the title. And for that matter, it was controlled to public policy and was an illegal uh, 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 contract. That's part of the fact that the plaintiff had been defrauded. Yes, he knew that he was entering into an improper agreement and he could not recover back the money he had paid to the charity, nor could he recover damages from the charity or its secretary. It's just like you enter into an agreement with someone who says that I'll get the visa for you, right? I'll get a visa for you and so on. Uh, now, you should know that uh, such a contract, if it's not kept by the other side, you go to court, you're going to be faced with uh, the reasoning in some of these uh, case law which you'll be looking at. Because you are trying to uh, promote uh, corruption, you are trying to uh, encourage violation of laws concerning how certain matters are, are attended to.
yeah, maybe let's uh, cite uh, uh, the case of uh, Okanti and Kwade, which is a uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, the case of uh, uh, Okanti and Kwade, uh, Okanti and Kwade, 1975, uh, one Ghana law report, 193. A uh, very uh, interesting case, which is uh, uh, similar to the reason in the Parkinson uh, case, which we have uh, discussed. But I will uh, leave you to uh, to read that, but just to re-emphasize that it's just on the same force with what we are discussing, that where you enter into a contract, uh, which uh, or encourage or promote inefficiency or corruption in public life. I seem unenforceable. So you can uh, look at that at page uh, 254 of uh, Mrs. Zuna Hammond's uh, book as well. Then a uh, contract prejudicial to administration of justice. Uh, we've explained that, that where you enter into contractual arrangement, uh, seeking to either prevent prosecution. Maybe like someone, you are going to be prosecuted. You try to uh, enter into an arrangement with someone, maybe the prosecutor or those who uh, have the power to make the decision that, well, uh, if you do S, Y, Z, uh, then don't prosecute me. I'm going to pay this money, I'm going to pay that. So that one is a that is prejudicial to administration of justice. So therefore, when the police have arrested you, they have investigated, they have uh, charged you, and you're going to be arranged court, and you try to enter into contract with the prosecutors or uh, those who are in charge of the, the, the state department, that is a two general department. And not too long ago, you heard of like the case of one uh, the state attorney in some way, as in Tamale or Bolga, uh, concerning a, a transaction, which can be characterized as a, a transaction prejudicial to administration of justice, uh, in the sense that it was seeking to prevent a person from being prosecuted for a crime, uh, which he or she had been uh, charged uh, as uh, it were. Or where you enter into contract and you promise to give false evidence in criminal proceedings, that is also illegal, uh, where you try to uh, you know, take a bribe or anything and say that, well, we are going to give a certain uh, testimony uh, for the purpose of helping the prosecution or for the purpose of uh, helping accused person to actually um, uh, escape, uh, to actually escape uh, the long arms of the law. That is uh, 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 illegal. So uh, we can, the number of cases uh, which uh, illustrates that, we can look at the case of uh, R. and Andrews. Uh, the defendant witnessed a traffic accident between a motor car and a mob, and as a result of which criminal proceedings uh, against the car driver were contemplated. The defendant invited the car driver to pay him to give false evidence at the prospective uh, prosecution. And the driver offered him a sum of money, but no bargain was in fast track. So the defendant was uh, convicted on the charge of inciting the motorists to pervert the course of uh, justice. I mean, just as uh, in the case of uh, Kier and Lehman, uh, a similar thing uh, happens. In contract, which are prejudicial to the interests uh, of the states, are also uh, illegal and unenforceable. Uh, here, a number of examples to be cited. Let's suppose that uh, Ghana is at war with another country, or uh, Ghana has declared certain countries as its enemies. Now, where you, for example, decide to enter into contract with citizens or residents of the enemy country, or you decide to do any form of trading with them, 
that is a contract prejudicial to the interests of the state. And a very good illustration is the case of the Ragazzoni against uh, KC Setia Limited. An ordinance uh, had been issued by the government of India during the colonial time. And same prohibited the taking of goods out of India if they were in any part of South Africa. Uh, don't forget that uh, South Africa was practicing serious form of uh, apartheid and all that. And uh, India, like many other countries, did not like it. Or were intended to be taken to South Africa despite being initially destined for another country. KC Setia Limited, an English company, agreed to sell and deliver to Polisino Ragazzoni 500,000 bars of jutes. Now, to the knowledge of both contracting parties, the jute was to be shipped from India to Genoa so that it might there be resold to a South Africa buying agency in contravention of the Indian uh, ordinance. The company that is a KC Setia Limited failed to deliver the jute and Policino has only claimed damages an English court for breach of contracts. Uh, KC Setia Limited, that is a company, defended the action, making the argument that the contract was to Policino's knowledge, an illegal contract, and therefore unenforceable as uh, its breach the Indian ordinance and was also harmful to the interests of the state. Well, eventually, when the matter made its way to the uh, English APS the House of Laws, uh, the court held that as a matter of public policy, the contract was unenforceable in England and its mm -hmm. performance will, will have improved as the parties were well aware doing an act in a friendly foreign country which violated the law of that uh, country. Yeah, so uh, just trying to say that uh, if you take uh, England, India at the time, they were a friendly country. So if India had a policy that it did not want to have any commercial dealings with the South Africa because of its apartheid uh, policy or any other thing, uh, the English court did not consider it appropriate that it will encourage contractual arrangement uh, which seeks to uh, undermine interests of uh, the state. What is the interest of the state here? The interest of the state here is that it wants to keep good relation with its friendly nations. This friendly nation had a law which prohibits trading with a certain third country, South Africa in this particular case. So that was the point the court was trying to uh, make. Now, uh, so what happens where it's established that there has been illegality? The contract was as a result of uh, uh, illegality. Well, as far as the consequences or the legal effect of illegality is concerned, we need to appreciate that depend uh, very much upon uh, whether the contract was illegal at the very inception or the illegality was during the enforcement or performance of the obligation. Sometimes a contract which might have been legal in the sense that it was not uh, control to any law or public policy at the time that it was made, could become illegal in its performance. So we have to know illegality may be at the inception or illegality may be uh, in the performance. But the general principle of the law is that a contract which is illegal from the start will be void and unenforceable because it's a nullity. Therefore, monies or properties transfer under such a contract is usually not recoverable. And mind you, the reason is that the whole thing 
was illegal from the very inception. And if it's illegal from the very inception, that is to say that it was uh, prohibited by law to start with. And, and that is why it is uh, impressed with anality. But this general rule, uh, just like a lot of general principles in law, admit of some exceptions or derogations. So what are some of the exceptions or derogations? So let's look at some of them first. A party or a plaintiff or claimant may be able to recover money or property transferred under an illegal contract if he can establish his right to the money or the property without relying on the illegal contract. In other words, if you can prove that you are entitled to the money that you are complaining of, and if you can do that without linking your entitlement to the illegality, then you will be able to uh, as uh, it were. <coughs> So for example, if we look at the uh, Bowmakers Limited against uh, Barnett Instruments Limited, the, if we look at that case, for example, that's why I'm teaching, I'll call it later. Yeah, so if you look at the uh, Bowmakers uh, Limited against uh, Barnett Instruments Limited, the plaintiff will supply with machine tools, lend them to the defendants under three, high purchase contracts. What time regulations provided that no person was to pay or receive any price for uh, any uh, machine to provided in the UK. So a maximum price had been issued by the Ministry of Supply. The Ministry of Supply, that is the ministry in charge of uh, ensuring uh, of essential goods during the war time. All three contracts were assumed to contravene this uh, regulation. But the defendant failed to make these agreements uh, deal and sold the tools they had acquired under two of the contracts. Then they refused to return the tools uh, held under the third contract. The defendants made the argument that the plaintiff had no remedy because the contracts were in breach of the regulation and therefore illegal. And the plaintiff brought an action for conversion of the tools. When we say conversion, conversion is a, an action in the law of thought, in the law of contract. In the law of thought, uh, where someone has taken uh, items uh, belonging to you without your permission and all that, uh, one of the causes of action open to you is to sue for conversion. If we like uh, equivalent of uh, stealing in criminal law, but this is not uh, a criminal law. Now, before the court could actually resolve the question as to whether they have a conversion or not, uh, it's necessary to determine the character of the underlying uh, contract. And the court held that uh, action uh, could succeed because it was not based on uh, funding a claim contract which were illegal, but on the plaintiff's proprietary right to their own uh, goods uh, as it were. Another exception is that where the parties are not in pari delicto, where the parties are not in pari delicto, that is where they are not equally guilty. Meaning that uh, uh, one is guilty of the illegality and then the other is not guilty of the illegality, so to speak. But let us uh, see uh, the Ghanaian case of uh, Quartin and Donko, before I tell you about Kerry Cotton Limited. In Quartin and Donko, uh, reported in 1960, one Ghana law report, page 20, 
Martin and Donko, 1962, one Ghana law report, 20. The defendants in 1948 borrowed 600 pounds from the plaintiff and managed to pay back only 80 pounds by 1950. The two entered into an agreement which was later reduced into writing. The agreement provided that if the Agogohene Kwekudria is distilled as a result of a committee of inquiry, or defendant helps the Krokomase people to elect one of their relatives as the Agogohene, the plaintiff promises to dash the whole amount of 520 pounds to Kofi Donko, the defendant. Defendant, an influential person, helped to frame the disumen charges against the said Kwakudia and testified against him. He was eventually distilled. The defendant also supported the candidature of the plaintiff's nephew, who, though elected, was never instilled. The plaintiff, therefore, brought this action to recover 520 pounds, which he maintains Defendant still owed him. He sought to evade his agreement to forgo this amount by alleging that it was illegal and contrary to public policy. And eventually, it was held uh, by the court that an agreement to improperly influence, to use influence, to secure for someone the election to a public suit merely for financial consideration and irrespective of the candidate's merit, is injurious to the public interest and illegal. The court held further that money paid in furtherance of an illegal contract cannot be recoverable where the parties are in pari delicto, stating that the law on public policy in Ghana will not be advanced by distinguishing between the case where actual money is paid over in pursuance of an illegal transaction, and one where, as in this case, the considerations are promised to forgo a debt. This was a high court decision, but the judge who presided over it, as we know, very respectable judge, uh, Afalu J, as he then was, who eventually became uh, uh, a Supreme Court judge and then uh, chief justice. And, uh, he had this uh, to say, and I quote, it seems to me fairly well established that, except in the recognized circumstances, money paid in pursuance of an illegal contract cannot be recovered by action. One of the exceptions of this rule is that where the parties are not in pari delicto. In my opinion, in this case, both parties are in pari delicto. The plaintiff voluntarily was willing to part with as much as 520 pounds as consideration for the defendant using his influence, as he well knew, corruptly to secure for his nephew and summon to the public. The defendant on his part was willing to lend his influence and services in return for that sum. There is no question here of one man holding a rod and that they're having no alternative but to submit, unquote. And so that is Quartin uh, and uh, Donko uh, reinforcing the point that uh, you can only recover money uh, paid under illegal contract if it can be shown that both parties are not in parallel delete to that is to say that you are innocent of the illegality, and it's only the other party who is guilty of the illegality, so to speak. The same point was made in the well-known English case of a uh, Kiriri Cotton Limited against the Wani. Uh, in Kiriri Cotton Limited against Wani, uh, Kiriri Cotton left a flat in Uganda for a term of seven years. The Wani, uh, who paid a premium of uh, 10,000 shillings. Although neither party realized they were breaking the law, the taking of the premium was in fact a breach of a government ordinance. Just like in Uganda, we have the, the Rent Act 
and all that. And if we look at it, it's even illegal to take a rent for more than six months. But people have been taking you know, rent advance two years, five years, 10 years, and all that. So it was a similar situation in the Kiriri Cotton Limited against uh, Diwani. Now, this ordinance uh, did not make any express provision that an illegal premium was recoverable by the tenants. Now, Diwani brought an action to recover the premium, that is an excess uh, payment. And the matter traveled to the Privy Council. Now, for the sake of, of course, all of you are legal uh, system students, and also for the sake of our visitors who are getting ready for the law school exams. Uh, when we say the Privy Council, Privy Council during the colonial days was the highest appeal court for the colonies. So the highest appeals court for the colonies was not their local court of appeals or the regional court of appeals. This has maybe like in Ghana, for example, uh, the good we used, to, we came to have what we call the WACA, the West Africa Court of Appeal. Now, if a case were decided by the court in Ghana, the Supreme Court, and you're not happy, you could go to the West Africa Court of Appeal. And then from there, it could also go to the, the Privy Council. So Uganda too, they too were British colonies. That was why their decision uh, used to go to the Privy uh, Council. So that is the reason for seeing the Privy Council here. Now, when the matter got to the Privy Council, uh, it was held that the premium was recoverable by the tenant, despite lack of an express provision in the ordinance permitting this. Because the court said that it was clear that the statute was aimed at protecting a particular class of person from another, namely prospective uh, tenants from uh, landlords. So here, it was like uh, the statute, which was probably creating the impression that the tenant, despite the fact that had paid more than what was permissible under the law, could not be said to be, uh, if you like, equally guilty. The, the land, of course, and for good reasons. They are not dealing with at arm length. The landlord definitely has got the economic muscle more than the, than the tenant. So the tenant could, for example, be bullied to do what the tenant even knows the law does not even permit. And that could be a way of uh, justifying the Privy Council decision in Kerry Cotton Limited. Another exception to the rule that uh, you cannot recover money or property under illegal contract is where a party withdraws or repents before the contract has been substantially performed. So where there's a repentance or uh, what do you call the where there has been a, 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 a locus a penitentia, where there has been a, a locus penitentia, that is, you have had like the, a change of uh, a mind or a change of heart, or the illegal contract was uh, substantially performed, you could uh, recover payment that you had made under that. And a case which illustrates that include the case of uh, uh, Kelly and Thompson. Uh, Kelly and Thompson, the defendants were solicitors who were acting on behalf of solicitors who were acting on behalf of the uh, creditor petitioning against a uh, bankrupt. They are the plaintiff, a friend of the bankrupt, agreed to pay defendants their costs if they did not. Uh, appear at the public examination of the bankrupt. And if they did not oppose the order of discharge against the bankrupt, the money was paid and the solicitors did not appear at the public examination. However, before the application to discharge the bankrupt, the friend changed his mind and sought the return of his money from the defendants. And the court held that the plaintiff uh, could not recover. The contract was illegal since it interfered with the administration of justice. And as the defendant had partly performed his contracts, the plaintiff's repentance was too late. In other words, where 
there has been some significant performance of the obligation in the contract. And later on, you have a, a change of mind. The court will say that it is too late in a day. So if you want to enjoy from the, this particular, then you must have withdrawn uh, from being part of the legal contract or you ought to have repented before there have been substantial performance. If your locus for detentia is late, do not avail you. Uh, I think let's look at the uh, contracts which are considered uh, automatically uh, 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 void uh, at common law. Contracts will ask the jurisdiction of the courts if uh, you have a contract which is seeking to ask the jurisdiction of the courts. Uh, but I think before that, before that, let uh, me uh, just say few more words about what we're just discussing. Because of the Supreme Court decision, especially uh, that is uh, uh, that bars, uh, uh, in the well-known case of uh, uh, CCW against ME, that is a country in which uh, uh, limited against a crime metropolitan assembly. Uh, let me spend the, uh, a bit more time here because it's a very important, uh, it's very important legal uh, decision. And if you are learning illegality uh, of contract in Ghana, and you you don't read uh, this, I don't think you have done the justice to the topic. So. The case is the uh, city. And of course, Mrs. Jonah Hammond has put in the book as well. City and country limited. Country West. Metropolitan. Sunday, Okay, so let's say a few more words about uh, this case uh, before we go on to look at other aspects of uh, illegality. Now the city and country was limited against Accra Metropolitan Assembly, 2007-2008 uh, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report uh, 409. It's very uh, important uh, decision, especially regarding how the courts will manage the consequence of uh, illegality. And I'd like you to read the full uh, decision, okay? Uh, I'd like you to, uh, my first year students, I'd like you to read like the full decision. And of course, if you are revising your knowledge of contract, you decided to read it, you'll not be doing any bad thing to yourself. You'll only be saying what uh, you know. What happened in the city and country was limited uh, against the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Uh, the city and country was limited, that is the plaintiff in this case. Uh, they had the business equivalent of what the uh, Zoom Lion is doing. Uh, waste collection, disposal and management and all that. So an agreement was made in December 1997, uh, between City and Country was Limited and then the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. By uh, this agreement, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly engaged uh, the plaintiff 
to be in charge of waste disposal services, including landfill services within the city of uh, Accra. And this agreement was to last for, this agreement was to last for seven uh, uh, years from the date of its execution. The agreement further provided that both parties had the option of renewing it for a further seven years. So uh, City and Kendry West Limited, that is a plaintiff uh, uh, hearing, started work under the agreement uh, July 1999 and continued to perform its obligation under it until uh, two years time, that is a June 2001. When Accra Metropolitan Assembly, that is the uh, AMB, uh, terminated the agreement. Of course, look at it. If you look at the date, I'm sure that this is a political changes in Ghana, which uh, was responsible for termination. Because if you look at it, if you look at the timing, uh, 2001 was when uh, President Rollins and NDC had left, and then President uh, John Ejekum before an NPP had come to power. Uh, if you remember, no wonder in Ghana when we have like a change of. Uh, government, uh, some of these things uh, happen. So the assembly at the time decided to terminate the, the contract. <coughs> but the plaintiff continued to perform its uh, obligations uh, under it. And later on, the plaintiff brought an action in court arguing that the termination of the agreement by the Accra Metropolitan Assembly was a breach of contract and sought uh, damages and zero payment and all that. Now, in its defense to the action, that is the uh, Accra Metropolitan Assembly pleaded that the agreement, the service agreement between City and Country Waste Limited and the EME was unenforceable and illegal because it was executed in breach of certain provisions of the local government at 1993, which was the legislation in force at the time. I'm sure you remember that the Local Governance Act uh, has now uh, repealed this particular legislation, but that was the legislation in force at the time. And also the certain provision of the standing orders of the AME. So the assembly was essentially saying that the agreement had been made in contravention of proper procedures for making a contract under the assembly, which included uh, that it will have to go through a, a tender, they have to be like the you know certain approvals and all that. And all those things, according to the AME, were not done. So simply put, that the agreement that the agreement had been had, had been made in a manner which contravened the proper procedure for. Uh, making agreement between AMA and any other entity as established by uh, local government and various uh, delegated legislation AMA as uh, it were. So at the end of the trial, the first trial high court in Accra uh, found on evidence that yes, the agreement was illegal because it was made in, in in contravention of statutory provisions, uh, which the AME had actually uh, pointed to. It was also against a uh, public policy. Then the trial judge, after holding that under the common law authorities, it is not all illegal contracts that are unenforceable. He went on to enforce the performance stage of the contract, which he had declared illegal. So eventually, 
the matter was uh, appealed to to the court of appeal, and the court of appeal uh, came to a different conclusion that the service agreement between city and country was limited and then Accra Metropolitan Assembly was not illegal, meaning that it was legal. So the court of appeal thought that it was legal. Then the AM was not satisfied, so they made further appeal to the Supreme Court. And then when it went to the Supreme Court, the AMA continued with its old argument that the contract executed between the AMA and then the city and country waste was not only expressly, but also impliedly prohibited by such provisions, which uh, AMA had actually uh, told us earlier on. So eventually, uh, the Supreme Court had to decide the matter. And the Supreme Court unanimously uh, dismissed the, the appeal, uh, subject to reversing the decision of the court that the contract executed by the parties was legal and unenforceable. But I would like us to uh, pay attention to uh, some details of the decision of the Supreme Court insofar as relates to uh, illegality, and especially with respect to the consequences of the illegality, if you look at uh, uh, the holding, uh, I would like you to look at the holding number six and seven, and that summarizes uh, Justice Dutterbar's uh, opinion. But as I said, it will even be much appreciated by me if you even read like the full uh, judgment, uh, since that is that it will deliver the judgment of the court. His opinion just uh, ranges from page, pages 417 to page 441. So it's not a lot, just a few pages. But let's pay attention to uh, two holdings from the head note, which summarizes aspect of his uh, opinion. Uh, so I said they're holding six and seven. So starting from holding six, quote, the long-standing approach in the English common law was that where a contract was found to be illegal, as in the instant case, the benefits conferred under it, namely recovery of money paid or property transferred, were not recoverable. The traditional common law approach was subject to two main exceptions. First, where the parties were not in pari delicto or equally at fault. And second, where a party to any executive contract entered before performance. So you see how he's summarizing the principles that we were discussing. I'm continuing. On the facts of the instant case, it was the in pari delicto exception, which was the main and also the benefit recovered from the defendant surgery body was no money paid, money transferred, but rather the value of services rendered. In the interest of justice, it was reasonable for the plaintiff to seek to reverse the unjust enrichment of the defendant through its retention of the benefit of the plaintiff's services without any payment for them at reasonable rate, not necessarily coincident with the rate negotiated under the contract. It is open to this court, uh, just, that bar, just that bar speaking. It is open to this court to base an alternative constitutional claim on the plaintiff's claim for the recovery of the value of his services endorsed on this street. Although the plaintiff intent, the plaintiff uh, intent was to find that was to find that claim on the contract that we have held to be illegal. The plaintiff can legitimately argue that a restitutionally claim by it is not equivalent to enforcing the illegal contract. The plaintiff is bound by the unenforceability of the illegal contract. In the English case law, the illegality of a contract has been held to be an effective defense to even a restitutionally claim unless the parties are not impaired, delicto or equally at fault. Yeah, so uh, you know, 
that says that a bar in holding seven is trying to uh, play the devil's advocate and say that, okay, even if you cannot uh, recover because of illegality, what about uh, a claim in restitution? So a claim in restitution is just a, a development in equity. A course of action which says that uh, is against a good conscience and notion of fairness for a person to hold on to unjust enrichment or ill-gotten gain. And for that matter, be ordered to return uh, unjust enrichment or ill-gotten gain under a course of action we call personal uh, claim, as uh, it were. Now, finally, let me touch on the uh, portion of this decision in the holding seven. And every year, I refer students to this uh, uh, UK uh, Law Commission consultation paper on the legality of, uh, on contrast and trust. So that is where I'm going. That's why I'm taking all this well. So holding number seven, quote, to develop uh, Ghanaian law in the area of illegal contracts and for the courts not to be constrained excessively by the orthodox English law approach to the issues of illegal contracts. The court will adopt the structured discretionary approach. Resolution of issues arising from the illegality of contracts contained in the UK Law Commission's consultation paper on the effect of illegality on contracts and trusts. The approach was to be fleshed out on a case by case basis. On the first of the present case, balancing the need to deny enforcement to the contract sued on by the plaintiff against the need to prevent the unjust enrichment of the defendant and considering that in relation to the defendant's non-compliance with the surgery provision binding on it, the plaintiff was not in pari delicto or equally at fault. In a broad sense, the plaintiff must be paid reasonable compensation for the services it rendered to the uh, defendant." Unquote. So Justice uh, Dateba was trying to say that we don't have to be blinded by the common law uh, you know, automatic conclusions that uh, where the contract is illegal, unless you are impaired the little, you are not impaired the little, you cannot recover and all that. He said that it is better to have some kind of like a, a flexible approach and look at each uh, case, this own merits. And having regard to city and country which limited against the Kremlin Metropolitan Assembly, you notice that, yes, it is a fact that the agreement between the plaintiff and the AMA was made contrary to the requirements of the relevant legislation. Nevertheless, in the court view, the plaintiff, that is a city and country was limited, uh, was less uh, blameworthy and AMA was more at fault, as it were. The way AMA is very much aware of its internal uh, procedures, of its uh, requirements and all that. So you do not comply with that. And when a person has rendered service which you have benefited and it's time for you to pay, you raise a flag and say that we don't have to pay because the whole transaction did not conform to our laid down procedures as established by law. So that is where the under arrangement was coming in. And uh, Justice Dateba uh, uh, said that the thinking which has been expressed by the UK Law Commission's uh, consultation paper on effect of illegality on contract and trust could actually be uh, adopted and implemented. And he actually uh, sought to do that. So before I continue, I will take one or two questions on what we've done so far before I continue. And I would like you to be snappy when you are asking a question.
Okay, so since there are no uh, questions, we'll continue. Yeah, so we are going to talk about uh, contracts which are uh, void uh, at common law, contract to oust the jurisdiction of the courts. If you enter into a contract and you say that you do not want the court to intervene, when there's a then what it means is that you are trying to oust the jurisdiction of the court and uh, that is not uh, permissible. And again, contrast prejudicial to the status of marriage and also contrast and restraint of trends. So let us quickly tell them one after the other and say a few more words about. Yeah, so uh, the general principle of law is that uh, a contract which purports or seeks to oust the position of the court is void because uh, the court cannot be uh, prevented from intervening in uh, disputes. The courts should be given the, the say anytime it's a dispute so that it will help to adjudicate the rights of the parties. Now, this general principle that uh, if you have a contract which is seeking to oust the jurisdiction of the court, then uh, that is void is the case of uh, Baker and Jones. There are a lot of uh, uh, cases. Uh, Baker and Jones, uh, there was an association which controlled the sport of weightlifting in the UK. And according to the rules of that association, it vested the government of the association in the Central Council, made up of officers and certain uh, members. And the association empowered the Central Council to be the sole interpreters, and the emphasis is the sole, that is only, the sole interpreters of the rules, and to act on behalf of the uh, association, planning any matter, not dealt with by the rules. In all circumstances, the decision of the council was to be considered as final. And this is where the difficulty was. In all circumstances, the decision of the council was considered as well as final. So by implication, the courts had been ousted. The courts have been uh, denied uh, jurisdiction. Now there was disagreement uh, between the members and uh, there was a two uh, libel action uh, brought against certain members and council. And the central council authorized the payment of two sums of a uh, hundred pounds to solicitors out of the association funds towards the defendant's legal courts. A member of the association was aggrieved by how the Central uh, Council actually resolved this matter and sought to challenge the decision of the Central Council uh, in, the law, in the law court and sought a declaration that uh, the use of the association fund was improper. Now, when it came to court, they sought to raise an objection that the matter could not be entertained by the court because of uh, the provision in the association constitution that we have just discussed. But the court held that the provision in the rules, giving the central council the sole right to interpret uh, the rules of the association was contrary to uh, public policy and void. And the judge further explained that uh, though in principle, the parties to a contract may make any contract that they like. This is subject to certain limitations imposed by public policy. And one of those limitations is that the decision of the cause cannot be ousted by agreement of the parties. In other words, under no circumstance can anybody enter into a contract and say that he does not want the court to ever come in. Should there be any problem? You cannot contract to deprive or to strip the courts of uh, jurisdiction because the courts should be able to intervene in any 
uh, type of litigation uh, anytime necessary. So that one is uh, uh, very uh, important and we shouldn't uh, that. I mean, the same point happened uh, in the case of uh, the uh, Lee against the Schumann's uh, uh, Guild of Great Britain. And in Lee against Schumann's Guild of Br Great Britain, similar facts, uh, Lord Denning uh, made uh, a very beautiful uh, uh, dictum, which I quote, if parties should seek by agreement to take the law out of the hands of the courts and to put it into the hands of a private tribunal without any recourse at all, the courts in case of error of law, then the agreement is to that extent contrary to public policy and void. In other words, Lord Denning in Lee against Schumann's Guild of Great Britain is trying to say that, yes, you could have your own internal arrangement for resolution of disputes. In so far as you have not shut the door to the courts, especially so uh, where there could be problems with uh, error or misapplication of the relevant rules and all that. The court should be able to come in and then tell us what the correct position is. Yeah, so that is uh, the point uh, in Lee against Showman's uh, Guild of Great Britain. And uh, a similar point was made by uh, the Supreme Court, our own justice uh, as in Aqua again, in the Inre Ghana Private Road Transport Union, GPRTU. That is the case between Tete and Sliffy. Uh, Tete and Sliffy uh, decided uh, in the 2001, 2002 uh, Supreme Court of uh, 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 Law uh, Report. Uh, again, it is a, a decision I would like uh, all of you to read because uh, it is uh, another. Uh, Beautiful uh, decision. And if you are to read it, I don't think that uh, you are wasting your time. You rather gain uh, a lot of insight regarding uh, what we are discussing. Uh, you know, some of these uh, just, just, judges, especially uh, this is uh, uh, Aqua, the way he writes, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's really beautiful. So. I will encourage you to make time and read uh, some of these uh, decisions. As I have told you in class, as far as uh, uh, law is concerned, you get a, a better understanding or you get a, a, a deeper insight more you read the decided cases. Um, the more you read the decided cases, you get a better understanding. And when I am quoting some of the cases, you notice that uh, the principles that we'll be discussing are even uh, summarized by uh, some of the judges before they will even make their own, uh, they come to their own conclusion and so on, as this may be. And that is why we shouldn't uh, feel uh, lazy about reading uh, the cases uh, as it were. So in a sliffy, uh, our tete in a sliffy, uh, the Supreme Court uh, held that uh, courts will normally respect the wishes of parties to an agreement to submit their disputes to an arbitration. However, the courts have always had the power to inquire into the validity of such exclusionary clauses to determine if they relate to the ordinary condition of the court. In other words, uh, in Tata and Sliffy, the Supreme Court was just following the reasoning uh, Lord Denning uh, deployed in Lee and Schumann's Guild that yes, it is permissible for you to do your own internal arrangement for arbitration, any form of alternative dispute resolution mechanism, that is fine. But 
you shouldn't ever say that under no circumstances can uh, an aggrieved party come to court. Sometimes, even within the particular ADL procedure that we've agreed upon, be it arbitration, uh, mediation, conciliation, or whatever, something might have gone wrong and uh, a person might have suffered injustice. Maybe the audio part of natural justice have been broken, in which case uh, the person was not granted hearing or the rule of Nemo Yudas in Casa Sua, uh, the rule against the personal bias or having an interest in the case, uh, presiding over it or being a judge in his own court. So all these are matters which could, for example, affect integrity of a devil resolution, which your internal uh, resolution uh, settlement mechanism so to do. And for which reason, the court should uh, be allowed to come in as and when necessary. And there is a, a, an old uh, case uh, which we call the, the case of a Scott and we have like the case of a, a Scott and Ivory. Yeah, yeah, I'm teaching, I can't talk later. Why? All right. The, the, the case of Scott and, the, and, and Ivory, uh, which of course uh, propounded the very principle that the, the Supreme Court emphasized in the Tete and the Sliffy. And and for that matter, that principle is even called ivory clause. When you, you hear about ivory clause, ivory clause comes from uh, Scott and Ivory. And uh, in Ivory, uh, Scott and Ivory, uh, there was a contract between a ship owner and the underwriters uh, who made it clear that no action should be brought in the insurance until the arbitrators had dealt with any dispute arising between the parties. Later on, when uh, uh, the matter came to court, the court held that it is permissible the parties to agree that no right of action shall accrue until an arbitrator had decided on any difference which may arise between them. In other words, it is quite legitimate. It is quite legitimate for the parties to the contract to delay the intervention of the court. The parties to the contract say that you have to exhaust what you call internal remedies. You have to exhaust uh, internal procedures or what you call the local remedies before you could uh, go to court. So where you have a clause in the contract insisting that an aggrieved party must resort to uh, a certain internal mechanism before he or she could go to court. Now that is legitimate. That is uh, legitimate uh, in the sense that where that is not done, where that is not done, uh, I'm teaching, I'm teaching this, yes. So where that is not done, uh, what is that? the other party can go to court and raise a flag that the, the action or the result to court is premature. For that matter, the court should stay the proceedings to get the other party who has rushed to court instead of resorting to the internal mechanism or the internal procedures to go back and do what the contract says should be done uh, as a, 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 a you know, first point of call with respect to your grievance before you go to court. So the case, remember, is the Scott and Ivory. And as I said, sometimes you can hear about uh, an Ivory Cross. And Ivory Cross uh, simply means that uh, uh, the, as a general rule, uh, an arbitration clause should not, an arbitration clause should not out the jurisdiction of the courts. On the uh, other hand, the parties may provide in their contract that no cause of action will arise to the matter are determined by the arbitration. So that is an ivory clause, and that is what I indicated. And it's also consistent with the Supreme Court decision. It's also consistent with the Supreme Court decision in the, the Supreme Court decision certainly in the Sleafy.
Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so let's uh, keep that in mind. Uh, contrast prejudicial to status of marriage uh, is also void at common law. Uh, that is to say that uh, where there's an agreement to provide a reward to someone to procure marriage, that is legal. Uh, it's contrary to public policy and therefore void. Maybe let's cite the interesting case of uh, Herman against Charles Wolf. The plaintiff saw an advertisement in the finance paper, a matrimonial post, and fashionable marriage advertiser and later signed an agreement with the defendant in the following terms. In consideration of being introduced to or put in correspondence with a gentleman, through the influence of the proprietor of the paper entitled the matrimonial post and fashionable marriage advertiser, and in the event of a marriage taking place between such gentleman and myself, I hereby agree to pay the said proprietor the sum of 250 pounds on the date of my first marriage. So this was the agreement, very interesting agreement. The plaintiff also paid the defendant a special fee of 52 pounds. The plaintiff was introduced to several men by the defendant who also interviewed and wrote on her behalf, but no marriage or engagement followed. So she sued the defendant to recover back the 52 pounds. The court held that the transaction of this case came within the rule, which implicates marriage brokerage contract. That is a contract in which uh, you accept to be an agent uh, to look for uh, a husband or wife for another person. Of course, uh, this is a very old, right? This is uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the 20th uh, century, 1905. But because today, if you look even if you look even at UK, there are a lot of uh, what they call the uh, they call it uh, what is the name dating uh, agencies or dating services. Some can even create an event, uh, and the event is meant to bring those who are looking to get partners. You go there, and all of you you are all looking for someone, and then the hope is that you need to uh, find someone. So it's done. They also have a website and all that. So this uh, particular one is a, a very uh, old uh, common law uh, decision. But that is uh, that that is it. Mm. Now let's come to here. This is a very important aspect of uh, illegality uh, public uh, policy. That is a contract restraint of trade, and it is uh, uh, very important that we. Uh, learn it as well. Now, contract in restraint of trade uh, present a, a certain challenge to the law. And what is that challenge? Uh, so first of all, we will explain what it, the, the contract of restraint, restraint of trade is. And then I'll tell you about the challenge and how the, the common law tries to strike a balance. Now, a contract in restraint of trade as the term itself suggests, is one that contains an undertaking which restricts the future freedom of one person to freely carry on or exercise his business, trade or profession. So uh, it includes a contract relating to sale of a business in which the person selling the business will agree that following the sale of the business with a new purchaser. He is not going to do anything which will compete with the purchaser. Or uh, one may say that I'm going to accept to be, I'm going to let to be my only supplier. I'll not take supply of goods uh, from any other uh, person like solus agreement and all that. Or uh, when it comes to employment, a person will say that once I have accepted to work with you, should I stop working with you? I'm not going to work for your uh, rivals or your competitors within a certain uh, period of time and within geographical radios and all that. So all these are manifestations of contract in restraint of trade. And 
fundamentally, it is problematic. Problematic in, in, in the sense that it seriously undermines freedom of contract. It undermines freedom of contract. It also undermines the ability of a person, essentially the ability of a person to earn a living. How could you contract out ability to earn a living? So that is problematic. And that is why a common law, a contract in restraint of trade is contrary to public policy and void unless it can be shown to be reasonable and contrary to public uh, interests. So a, a very high uh, bar is set for its validity. It must be shown to be reasonable and not contrary to public interest. Uh, public interest lies in the fact that every rational adult should be able to out a legitimate uh, work and earn a living. So where a person is contracting his ability to engage in legitimate work and earn a living, then that is problematic. A typical uh, illustration of contract in restraint of trade, uh, we can see that in the case of uh, uh, Nordenfeld, against Mazim Nordenfeld Guns and Ammunition Company Limited. There, the seller of a gun and ammunition uh, manufacturing uh, business agreed with the buyer, not directly or indirectly, to engage in the business of a manufacturer of guns or ammunition anywhere in the world or compete in any way for a period of 25 years, for a period of 25 uh, years. Though the undertaking not to fit in any way was considered unreasonable by the court as being too wild, the provision not to manufacture guns was held to be valid because even though it was a worldwide restriction there was only a limited number of consumers so that the restriction was not uh, wider uh, than was necessary to protect uh, the company and it was not injurious to the public. So uh, Nordenfeld against uh, Mazim, uh, Nordenfeld gas, Guns and Ammunition, ammunition the company uh, uh, limited give us a sense of what the court will consider as a, a reasonable uh, restraint. Now, I would like us to pay uh, particular attention to Lord Magneton's uh, uh, dictum at page uh, 565. And when I mention Lord Magneton, I hope you remember your criminal law. How do you call the Magneton principles? Remember your criminal law, magnetic principle, of course. Uh, my first year students at the KNUSC, they wouldn't know because they would do criminal law in the second year. But I, I, I'm, I'm referring to uh, our guest students who are preparing for the law school and trans examination. So magnetic principles uh, uh, in relation to uh, insanity, uh, yeah. So, uh, Lord Magneton had the following to say, and I quote, the public have an interest in every person's carrying out his trade freely. So has the individual. All interference with individual liberty of action in trading and all restraints of trade themselves. If there is nothing more contrary to public policy and therefore void, that is the general rule. But there are exceptions. Restraint of trade and interference. And interference with individual liberty of action may be justified by the special circumstances of a particular case. It is a sufficient justification, and indeed, it is only justification if the restriction is reasonable 
that is in reference to the interests of the parties concerned and reasonable in reference to the interests of the public, so framed and so guarded as to afford adequate protection to the party in whose favor it is imposed, while at the same time, it is in no way injurious to the public. Yeah, so uh, that is the balancing uh, uh, exercise which the courts will have to do with respect to uh, what is acceptable as a legitimate uh, contract in restraint of trade and what is not acceptable. And that is what Lord Magnetin is reminding us. So as I have indicated, contracts in restraint of trade may take many forms, but the most uh, common examples are one, restraint in the contract of employment, uh, two, restraint on the sale of business, Three, a solus agreement by which a trader agrees to restrict his orders from one supplier. Four, price facing agreements and agreement which seek to regulate or limit supplies of goods. Five, restraint affecting uh, other interests. So we say a few words about each of them and then see how uh, the law is calibrated with respect to the balancing. Uh, SSI with Lord Magneton uh, hinted in the uh, Nordenfeld against Muslim Nordenfeld against a mission company's uh, case no longer ago. So first of all, we will discuss uh, restraint in the contract of employment. Restraint in the contract of employment. Now, it is uh, common for an employment contract to contain an express term or covenant, which purports to restrict freedom of the employee on the termination of employment, engaging in a competing business or working for a competitor for a certain period. That is, uh, uh, you can see that uh, in some contract, especially uh, those who are working in a very sensitive uh, uh, areas and where uh, you know the employer needs to protect three secrets so that those three secrets uh, are not uh, leaked and so on. It may be uh, legitimate for uh, such uh, a clause to be uh, included in the contract. Now, the caveat is that uh, such a clause will be entertained and treated as valid, so long as it is inserted to protect uh, legitimate proprietary interests of the employer and is reasonable in extent, and the covenant will be therefore be deemed as a valid and enforceable. So therefore, uh, in trying to determine the validity of a restraint clause in the employment contract, uh, the court will have a uh, regard to important uh, factors. And what, what are they? Uh, one, uh, restraint in the contract of, uh, uh, first of all, the restraint must seek to protect some legitimate proprietary interest of the employer. So the, the employer must be able to show that I have this legitimate proprietary interest uh, which needs to be uh, protected. And that is why I have structured this uh, uh, restraint clause in the contract of employment. So what are some of the legitimate proprietary interests for which an employer may need protection? These include clientele, right? The, your, your client base or your customer base. Uh, you need to have them because if the clientele or the customers are not there, then the business will collapse as it were. Then confidential information, information which are not ordinarily available because of certain privileged uh, circumstances. Uh, that is how the, the business came to have it. So the employer, we want to protect that. Trade secrets. Uh, yes, trade secrets. Let me take, for example, we take Coca-Cola, right? 
uh, some of you like Fanta and Coca-Cola. It is said that as we speak now, uh, nobody uh, know the formula for making uh, Coca-Cola because uh, Coca-Cola because the the, the 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 management or the the company have been able to generously guard against this particular trade secret that it will come out. And one way of securing that is uh, making sure that you put the necessary restraint clauses in the contract of employment of those you are going to who are going to work who are going to be working for you in such a sensitive uh, areas, so that they don't leak your trade secrets in order to dilute your business. And two, the restraint uh, clause must be reasonable in the circumstances. So it's not enough for the employer to say that the restraint uh, clause in the contract of employment uh, protects my legitimate proprietary. More importantly, the court will need to test that by finding out whether it meets the reasonableness test. And if it's the reasonableness test, what do I mean? That is to say that having regard to the scope of it, vis-a-vis -vis the proprietary interest of the employer is the restraint clause more than necessary? Is it excessive? Is it more than what is really needed to protect the interests of the employer? So those are the kind of things that the court will get into. Yeah, so we have said that the first factor which the court will look at in trying to determine whether a restraint clause in the contract environment is uh, valid or not uh, will depend uh, upon whether the employer had the uh, legitimate proprietary interest. And for that, we could look at the case of uh, Foster and Sons Limited against the Sajet. In Foster and Sons uh, Limited against the uh, uh, the defendant was employed as a plaintiff's works manager and had been instructed in their confidential manufacturing processes for glass. Just like the Coca-Cola example that I mentioned. The contract of employment contained a covenant whereby the defendant was not to divulge any trade secrets and was not to carry on or be interested in glass manufacture or any business connected with glass making carried on by the plaintiff for five years after the termination of his employment. So uh, when he sees working for the employee, no time, he started working, you know, behaving contrary to uh, what the clause is, and an injunction was brought against him. And the court granted the injunction to restrain uh, the, him from diverging of trade secrets, namely the confidential manufacturing process. Uh, since in the court view, the restriction was reasonable to protect the company's interests, even though it extended to the whole country and lasted uh, five years. A similar thing happened in the case of a Little Woods Organization Limited against Harris. Uh, I wanted to be able to finish, but uh, I need to end here. And over the weekend, uh, LLB uh, Yawan Rebbe Batam NRC, take note that I'll be sending you a link. We have uh, one or two more classes over the weekend. Uh, you know, we are pushing towards the, the completion uh, so that Tuesday, we'll uh, this chart of contract, especially frustration, performance, uh, and agreement, because you've already done the remedies and breach. Now you should be done, and then you for the examination in two weeks time. Yeah, so as I am uh, ending, I will take this a uh, few questions, but let me stop the recording now.